unless we go to circular, it's game over for the planet. It's game over for society. We don't have a choice but to do this. This is imperative for our survival. But if we really don't change our mindset, I think it will be the end of the world. We're moving from a world of 7 billion people on the planet to 9 billion. The way we're existing right now on planet Earth, this biosphere is really being driven by humans who are parasites. If you look at how much plastic pollution is accumulating in the ocean, that plastic is starting to accumulate in the fish that people eat. There's not a lot of stuff left. And the stuff that we've got, we've got to protect and we've got to care for and we've got to use efficiently. It's not utopia, it's necessity. I am frightened that my generation will be the first generation in the world which will leave my children and grandchildren an earth which they might never be able to fix. Whether it takes 20 years or 50 years or 100 years, it is inevitable that we will hit those limits. We'll run out of resources, or the pollution will become so bad that it affects our human health and we start to feel the impact as human beings. I think if we continue with the linear economy, we're, to use a technical term, totally screwed. Is it too late? This is one I get asked often when I lecture at Cambridge University and other places and sometimes I have to answer this way. If I look at the science and if I look at the trends and the facts, it's very hard not to be pessimistic. It's very hard not to say that we're heading off the cliff at 100 miles an hour. But if I look at the speed and the scale of the changes that are happening and I look at the people working on these problems, and I look at the breakthroughs in technology that we're seeing right now, it's very hard not to be optimistic. I began this journey of looking at the circular economy through my work in sustainability, but really through my realization after many years consulting to multinationals and businesses around the world on sustainability, that if we don't solve this one problem, everything else we do, no matter how well intentioned it is, will be like shifting deck chairs on the Titanic. Nobody's going to stop growing. Nobody's going to stop striving for growth, whether it's a country or a business or a consumer. And so the only way we fix that problem is to make it circular. And so I started to think, you know, I'm, I'm working in sustainability. I'm lecturing and consulting but it's just not enough the only thing that's enough is redesigning the industrial system literally a new industrial revolution closing the loop this is no longer a dream this is no longer a fantasy we're not talking about a utopia we're talking about something that is absolutely happening right now and that if others could follow the example of those we would change the world forever. That's why I'm so excited to go and visit these companies that are pioneering in this space, because they're showing that not only is it possible, but that they're doing it already. We don't need new technologies. They're already there. What we need is new thinking. And these companies demonstrate that we can bring that new paradigm, that shift to actually change the world today. I think it's an immensely exciting time. You've got experiments happening around the world in the sort of social entrepreneurship space, in the clean technology space, in the integrated reporting space, in the secular economy. It just, it, it, it goes on and on. And it's in that, that sort of almost historical U-bend that you would expect the ma maximum confusion, uncertainty, anger, sense of loss, existential challenge. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing at the moment. So the question for the sustainability industry, in a way, 
is can we project the sort of vision of a future that people would really aspire to and want to be part of? I think we can, but I, we've got to come together in a very different way. That's a great challenge. That's a really great challenge. But I think this is a great time to do it. We have a great opportunity to, to go ahead and, uh, and make the local government, make the city, the municipality, as the main actor in this process. You know, I think one of the things that allows me to be positive is I was fortunate to live through the transition in South Africa to democracy. And what I saw was we had a system where people resist change for decades, 40 years apartheid was in place. But when the change really started to happen, there was that tipping point and it happened incredibly fast. So, you know, I really believe that change can happen positively very quickly. What is circular thinking? It's the change in perspective, the shift in consciousness from linear thinking, take, make, waste, to circular thinking, how waste, instead of being disposed of or becoming pollution, rather becomes another product, becomes an input back into the process. The circular economy is a economic system that is, that is uh, regenerative by design. Essentially, uh, what we aim to do is to, to encourage our partners to move away from a linear economy where we take, make, dispose, or, or waste to a, to a take, make, take, make, take, make. So it's more optimization of resources that are already in the system to reduce the need for extraction of more uh, resources from, from, from a finite source, essentially. Yes, recycling is a big part of it, but so is uh, refurbishing, reuse, sharing, zero waste essentially, yeah? just closing the loop on the resources that are already in the system. I think the circular economy basically sex, sexes up waste, you know, it makes it quite funky. Suddenly, if you can buy a swimming costume that's made out of discarded fishing nets, what a great story, you know, because basically you're, you're, helping, you're helping to clean up the ocean, I guess, by maybe swimming in it at the same time. I tend to think that the circular economy um, represents our best chance of being able to consume comfortably and maintain our current lifestyles. The alternative would be to go back to the dark ages, and no one wants to do that. I think that circular economy is all about co-creation, working together, bringing all the innovations and knowledge together at and one chain and being responsible for what you are doing and making. Close the loop. So basically a, a perfect circular economy is where you have zero diversion to, to landfill that everything that you produce is recycled and brought back into economic activity that we get to a point where whenever an engineer or a designer designs a product that it will be compulsory for them to also put forward a recycling plan. I think a lot of what people call circular today is just generally improved waste management. It's not fundamentally thinking about produce something from the very beginning that can be circular, ensure that the customer can see real benefit from using it, a real benefit in terms of reusing it and returning it to us. So I think there's a challenge of genuinely satisfying customer need. We cannot be satisfied until tens of thousands of companies, hundreds of thousands of companies, servicing hundreds of millions of customers are really doing circular. And as long as it remains in the lab and exploration, we're struggling. And the world around us is moving so fast in terms of the climate crisis, the resource crisis. It is not enough to stay tinkering for the next 10 years. We need to deliver scale quickly.
Would you say that what you're doing here is in some way revolutionary? I would certainly say that this is revolutionary because we really changed the whole model of the way we do business. And we're moving from a take, make, waste model to a fully circular model. Aiming for zero impact, mission zero by 2020, that's pretty ambitious. That is pretty ambitious and with the present uh, capabilities and the present technology you cannot even imagine that you can achieve it. So this uh, really uh, ambitious uh, mission that Ray gave us really forces us to new avenues and that is very exciting. In Europe we are now you know, 98 percent reduction of carbon with 95 percent renewable energy. We have little use of water in our processes. We have no waste going to landfill and we have more than 50 percent of our raw materials are already recycled or bio-based. Now our challenge is how to upscale that to close to 100 percent in 2020. Innovation and sustainability are very interlinked in, in, in our company. Actually, the person in charge globally of, of sustainability is the same person in charge of innovation. So the, the, the idea is that any innovation that we put on the business should go for sustainability. Our R&D people developed a, a way to produce a carpet tile with about half of the uh, yarn that we use in a normal uh, carpet uh, tile and half the material use is a lot less environmental footprint, but in the meantime they created a completely new look, because there's almost no yarn in the tile, it's a very flat, minimalistic look, and it opened up uh, a complete new market for us, mm. especially in Scandinavia and in uh, Southern Europe, where they like uh, liked hard uh, flooring. There are many opportunities in the waste from other industries. If other industries are not clever enough to recycle their own waste, we will look at what is the potential waste which is interesting for us. So for example, we've looked at you know, fishing nets, gathering fishing nets to make nylon. We'll look at the laminated glass and extracting PVB from that laminating glass and using it as a substitute for latex. We're looking at various ideas for our backing. And the idea is that your processes are flexible enough so that they can take different waste streams and I think in normally in the, in, in the old industry model was about just you know making machines efficient for only one raw material. In the new model it's about making machines that maybe they're a little bit less efficient but they can handle more raw material. So here we're at the cutting process, uh, tell me what's happening here. Here we have an ultrasonic technology cutting which is uh, a unique in the industry. And the beauty of it is that it cuts 24 tiles at one stroke. So there, therefore there is no waste in between. It's ultrasonic, so it's very accurate. And it leaves little, little uh, waste on the side. Okay, so getting you closer to that goal of zero waste. Getting there. Uh, let's go and have a look at those trimmings. Yes. The only thing you have is these sides. These trimmings are at, at each side. Okay, it's very impressive, very thin, very few resources being used and wasted. So we're, what's the end of the process now? The next process is then when the tiles are, are in, in packaged in boxes. Okay, let's have a look. So it looks like this is the end of the process. That's the final stage. This is the packaging of the carpet tiles. Okay, and this goes out to uh, happy customers in Europe from here? Middle East and Africa. Okay. This is the manufacturing site that serves all that region. And uh, how many carpets uh, or how, uh, what volume are you, are you turning out here? Around 14 million square meters per year, which is around 60,000 square meters every day. So that's a lot of carpet, and uh, what we hope uh, with the Mission Zero is the more carpet you're selling, the more sustainable the world is getting. Yeah, we hope to get there as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking us around today. Thank you. And uh, we really hope that uh, you have all your success with Mission Zero. We're watching your progress and cheering you along the way. Brilliant. Thank you. All right.
What would you say to other companies that want to follow this revolutionary path, that want to be part of what is effectively the next industrial revolution? What are some of the lessons that you've learned that you could pass on? For companies to, uh, to uh, proceed on this uh, revolutionary path, uh, I would say it starts with your own people within the company. If, if you turn your own people into believers, if they get that uh, something has to change, then they become investors that work with your customers and that work with your supply chain. It starts with leadership and, and, and the top management having uh, that, uh, that, that vision and supporting that implementation. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, I, I really hope that we see this new industrial model come fully into being. Okay, to play a role in a revolution uh, like this is very exciting and very stimulating. And it really adds uh, something to working at Interface. And that, that's, uh, uh, that's true for me and that is true for all our employees. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. facility like this, uh, you take a long-term view on it. When you invest in something like this, you think beyond today, you think the next 20, 30, 40, up to maybe 100 years. Even though we may have invested a significant amount of money, the returns not only to Valo World, but to the country, to the world at large, is you can't quantify them. Give us an idea of, of what we have here and the scale of the operation. This is a 30,000 square meter facility and 20,000 of that is for the rebuilding of components and the remainder 10,000 is for warehousing purposes. Okay, and, and walk me through the process. What, what are the steps uh, when components arrive here? What happens? Once the component arrives here, we disassemble the component completely. We do an inspection on the component. Uh, we determine uh, what parts need to be replaced with new and which part can be refurbished and reused again. Parts would then go through a process of cleaning, refurbishment and then reassembly. After reassembly the component will be tested, uh, painted and then it's good to go back to the machine like new. Through remanufacturing re we are able to uh, reduce the cost of green business because we are able to give the customers components at a fraction of what it would cost to get a new one. When we remanufacture, it also reduces uh, the, the load on uh, raw materials such as iron ore and steel. And what we can't reuse, we send through to, uh, for recycling. So this is obviously a process that replaces having to get new equipment every time something breaks. That's the essence of remanufacturing. I presume there must be some real benefits to that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, benefits could be, depending on the component group, between 20% for a specific component after failure, uh, up to as much as 60% saving on the price of new. So the benefit is, is quite big. Is there a role for government to play in supporting these kinds of initiatives? In a big way. Government as a regulator, you know, they have a role to play one of the ways in which they could do is to provide tax incentives for facilities such as this, but also to make sure that uh, there's adequate uh, supply of uh, skills so that we can continue to bring people here and train them. Okay, so you've got definite economic benefits by what we call remanufacturing here, but they're clear environmental benefits as well. Iron is reused. I mean, there's an iron shortage or steel shortage worldwide, um, so we reuse steel and we also clean some of the runoff water on the cleaning plant and, and reuse some of that water for the cleaning process. What are some of the things you think that Barlow World has overcome uh, that are lessons that other industries could learn from if you were to advise them to go down the circular economy route? I think it would probably be to say let's think beyond uh, profits because if we don't take care of the environment 
none of us would be in existence. If we don't take care of the environment, none of us will be around uh, in years to come. And the generations to come will blame us. And therefore, it's a responsibility that each one of us has to make sure that uh, we do our best to minimize the impact of our economic activities on the environment. So let's think bigger. And also, when we become sustainable, uh, we take the cost out of doing business. Those increased profits, we should be reinvesting them to make sure that we become sustainable over many years to come. I am hoping that uh, my children and their grandchildren, uh, when I'm no more around, they would say, you know, we had a group of people who had the foresight to ensure that the economic activities of their companies reduce the impact, the negative impact on the environment. certain moment I went to Ethiopia and we saw the land and it was all uh, land filled with clothing and on that moment I said okay I have to take my responsibility and I have to do it in another way. Industrial revolution was started with the textiles so and we are stating okay we are from textiles let's start up a new revolution with textiles so we had to show that it's possible to make a, a raw material that's recyclable eight times we have to show that we can put it into the market uh, we have to show that we can track and trace it and uh, make an LCA, a life cycle analyze. Uh, we have to show that there are business opportunities and new business models. That's what we're showing with uh, performance-based contracting. And that's something amazing what's happening over here. You will see all the innovations, you will see all the clothing and the partnerships and the love, I hope. One of our innovations of the, of the suits, we, uh, we made together a new brand wherever. We made the suits for them and, and fa uh, fabrics and they are very young and they are going with emotion into the market making it very sexy to have a circular product. It's amazing. I mean, it feels great, uh, it looks great. Isn't this one of the concerns that if you go for a, a suit that is somehow sustainable or, or circular, that you sacrifice quality? It is polyester. Uh, however, if you look at polyesters which we can make, it's not what it used to be. Look at when you go sporting, for example. If you uh, wear a sport trousers, sport shirt, it's 100% polyester. If you look at the durability, this material is way stronger and therefore will last way longer than, for example, a woolen suit. So the technical lifespan of the product is, is quality-wise better. And that's quite different from what we sometimes call fast fashion, right? It's the opposite, I would say. It, it's definitely the opposite, because if you look at fast fashion, there are three pillars. Uh, it needs to be cheap, super affordable, so people can buy large quantities. Uh, it has a short technical lifespan, so people will throw it away quickly and also buy new clothing quickly. And it has a short stylish lifespan. Um, all these factors result in uh, huge quantities of resources needed, uh, fossil fuels needed to, to uphold the system. Yeah. And, and yeah, this is the opposite. I mean, how many times could this suit be recycled, turned back into fibers and back into a suit? Eight times. The Eight? quality we demand from this uh, fabric, we can uh, bring the fiber back to uh, the quality, our acceptable standard for eight times. Amazing. So, I mean, if, if this suit lasts me five years, that's eight times five, that's 40 years effectively you're that's making a with sustainable With entering suit. resources once and creating no uh, debris at the other end for 40 years. Here we 
are at the heart of your process and uh, tell me what's going on here. Well, at the moment we are at a melt spin process. Uh, that's what you can see over here. Uh, polymer pellets are loaded in this machine and it will convert the pellets to uh, PET yarn. So you keep this running and running and the pellets are melted. It comes out as uh, what you call filaments. So what is a filament? How big is it? How do you use it? Yarn consists of uh, hundreds or hundreds of filaments. One filament uh, has a diameter of about uh, 5 to 20 uh, micrometer. The human hair is uh, approximately uh, 80 micrometer. So this is in fact much smaller than the human hair. Okay, so anything from a quarter to even a tenth of a human hair. Now, what is it that makes something more or less recyclable when we're talking about these kinds of uh, yarns? Well, essential for the process is a clean waste stream. Hmm. If you have a lot of contaminations in your, in your waste stream, you're not able to process it into a filament or a yarn. So even dyes, if we're not thinking through the whole process, it could be that uh, the, the colouring that we add to the, to the yarn is making it less recyclable. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, and I suppose this is why it's so important to have the life cycle thinking. It makes it easier once you get to the end if you've thought about the beginning. Yeah, if you really think uh, of what you, how to handle in the start of the process, then it will help you in the end of the process. Then, then of course, we have to test the mechanical properties of the material. Uh, of course, you want to meet the same requirements as a virgin material. So, for example, what we do is test the tenacity of the yarns. Okay, well, this is quite important because you're suggesting that just because it happens to be recycled doesn't mean that it's got a lower performance. It goes through the same tests for performance as any other yarn. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's the big challenge of using recycled material. Uh, the challenge is to meet the same requirements, specifications, as a virgin material. But you're finding that's possible to do? Yes, I'm sure of that. here in a year about five or six million running meters and one loom is producing about 100 to 150 meters it depends to the style and fabric a day the equipment we see behind us do you need different kinds of equipment if you're doing circular threads and clothing no um, the machinery is always the same we use the same machinery but we have to use the right material coming to the final result. After eight weeks production, we see the ready finished Infinity fabric. Okay, what, uh, this is no ordinary fabric. What is Infinity fabric? Infinity fabric is 100% uh, polyester. It's recyclable and it has motion control function. So really a high quality, brand new fabric, okay. brand new developed. And this is what you developed uh, in collaboration with Dutch Awareness, and it's, yes, it's for yes. their suits especially. How long did that collaboration take? Uh, we worked more than 18 months on this. Wow. Through this fabric, you become part of the sustainability, yes. circular yes, economy right. revolution. How does that make you feel, this is your yeah, company? It, it makes us proud. It makes us really proud because it was a lot of work, and um, all my people worked um, hours and hours at this quality, and yeah, now they, we are happy to yeah, have the final product in our hands. Well, I think it's a big step because we are used to thinking uh, linear. Produce, sell, wear, stop. 
throw it away, and now we have to go to take it back to our production countries. So that's uh, another way of uh, thinking, not only for work wear, but I think for all kinds of industry. It has to be as well uh, supply and demand. We need uh, clients who say we want to uh, buy this and we are, uh, we are not afraid to pay maybe a little bit more for the, for the same quality. That is what we need. How did you come to choose the circular option for the outfits that your workers wear? We really find a supplier that had a vision and that was in this market. Together with our supplier, uh, Dutch Awareness, we could use clothing waste material in uh, construction materials. We are piloting a new material, uh, its name is, it, the name is Cliff, and we can use that uh, instead of this uh, wood, a problem with a lot of waste, uh, clothing waste, cotton waste in our cities. And if we harvest that waste and make it into a construction uh, material, uh, that's a second problem that you are solving with this material. This is the idea of urban mining, right? This is the idea of urban mining. Uh, use what the waste that you have, reuse it, and we also think we use it really nearby uh, where you are mining it. We are all in a red race of consuming, producing, and not thinking. Grabbing, eating, drinking, spoiling. Of course, we still have to eat and we must drink, but we have to do it with more awareness. And I'm a proud father of a, of a daughter, and I want for my daughter the best there is. The best in education, uh, the best in health, the best in everything, so also the best in a good environment. Uh, it's not only for my daughter, but also for the my children's children. A circular economy is the best for all of us. Just look at yourself, find yourself again, and make the right choice who you are and what you're gonna do and what you're gonna consume. That's the most important thing of all. The starting point was several different research projects in different areas, but the first one that arrived to uh, obtain important results was what we have defined as the complexation of starch. So the, the possibility to use starch as a regular plastics. From this uh, first uh, application, new products were, uh, were generated and uh, together with these new products also a new approach to chemistry and to the use of renewable raw materials yeah. and to the exploitation of biodegradability was developed. These uh, products are part of the raw materials that can be transformed in order to obtain uh, Mother B, Mother B that is bioplastics made using starch complexation technology. So it's a way to combine starch with some specific materials to obtain biodegradable. Uh, so, so the inputs are entirely natural from bio-based inputs and yes. the output is entirely biodegradable. This is a, a completely biodegradable material that can be transformed in several different products and these objects are, uh, can be used for, uh, for different uh, applications and then can be disposed uh, in an industrial composting plant. These are often the products that we dispose of very quickly exactly. in our throwaway society. And not only will they degrade, but you're saying the plastic bag will degrade as well. Exactly. So it is a perfect support to divert organic waste 
from landfill and from incineration. Now this is interesting because this looks to me like diapers or uh, disposable nappies and these are biodegradable also. Yes, this is uh, a, a back sheet. Uh, the, the back sheet is made by, by one of our Matterby grades and the back sheet is uh, a biodegradable. So how long would it take to get from that to this to that? It depends from the, the from the different objects, but the time can vary be between a few weeks and a couple of months. So 30 days, 60 days? 30 days, 60 quite days. Quick. Yes, quite quick. Yes. Yeah. So the, the, raw, the different raw materials are mixed and dosed, and uh, here the reaction, the transformation happens, and this is the, the finished product. It looks like spaghetti when it yes. comes through here. Yes, we are in Italy. So right. We like spaghetti. Okay, so it comes through as uh, plastic, bioplastic spaghetti. Yes. And then it ends up down there. And then uh, the product is cut down in small pieces. Yes. And the, the granules are, uh, are prepared. Yes. Okay. And those granules are what then goes to your clients? These granules go, uh, go to, our, uh, to our customers uh, to, uh, to be transformed orderly in different uh, items. Films or injection molded item. We've been looking at the process of producing bioplastics and uh, those uh, converting into compostable plastics, one of which is the Lavazza coffee capsule yeah. and that comes to you at the end of its life and what do you do with it? Yeah, we reuse the coffee waste, the new uh, capsule, and we use for making very good mushrooms. Now we were told that the plastic biodegrades yeah. and through a composting process is once again good for the soil and yeah. have you tested what the quality of that compost is? Yeah, we have tested that uh, the um, uh, vegetables grow much more with this kind of soil than the normal soil. It, it grows 30% more, means we have 30% more of zucchini, 30% of salad, so just putting the coffee waste in the soil. So you have to Try it. It's yep. amazing. And this is a relatively new idea of upcycling. Can yeah. you explain what you mean by that? We take the, the waste of uh, uh, production of food, means the, the coffee ground, and we used to produce uh, food again. We used to produce mushrooms, very good mushrooms. So the coffee is going back to the soil to produce new, uh, new food after producing food. So you're so actually creating value from what would have previously just been waste, gone to landfill yeah. and possibly created a problem in the environment. You've yeah. now created new value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a very good example. Yesterday we followed the road of the moon We drove all day towards the coast Remembered me the beauty of this life Such a feeling to be alive We take almost a quarter of a million tons of food waste from anywhere from households to manufacturing plants to retailers and we transform it here into renewable energy and as a byproduct of that we also produce a fertilizer that goes back on the field so a true closed loop process So this particular plant will um, take around 45,000 tons of food waste in a year and generate around 45,000 megawatt hours of electricity, which is enough to power around 40,000 homes. This is where all the food first arrives from uh, wherever it's come from, whether it's come from someone's home or from manufacturing or from a restaurant. And it'll be brought in here in big, big trucks. The guys will tip it on the, on the floor, yep. mix it up. Um, the more it's mixed, the better it is for, for the process. So once uh, it's been dumped here, how long does it sit here before it goes into process? Ideally, it doesn't sit on the floor for any more than a day. Uh, the fresher it is, the more calorific value, so the more gas we can generate. Right, right. So you take it from here and then it uh, goes into the process behind me. What happens here? The, the mobile equipment will, will pick it up in a bucket and transport it into the hoppers that you can see behind you. 
and in those hoppers it will be mixed and then it's slowly fed into a, a, a big machine that pulverizes it into as small a particle as possible okay. and then liquid is fed into it so it, it creates a slurry, uh, a pumpable liquid. All right now we've seen inside the process of receiving the food waste, uh, mangling it up and turning it into a kind of slurry and then it comes outside into these tanks so what happens in that process? The first part of the process is the, the liquid will go into the raw waste tank and there it's mixed and blended together um, and then it's, it's slowly fed into the two tall digestion tanks where it'll digest over a period of 35 to 40 days generating methane. That methane is then pumped to the gas holder which is the green bubble you see. Uh, there the gas is mixed and transported to the engines which turn it into electricity. Okay, so that's where the green electricity is that you create and you feed into the grid. But presumably you're left behind with all of that uh, waste and slurry. What happens to that? Once the, uh, we've, we've used all of the, the gas from the, from the liquid, the liquid is then uh, sent to a pasteurizer where it is cooked at 70 degrees uh, to kill off any pathogens or any germs remaining in the process. And then that liquid is then stored in tanks and there it will stay until it's needed for the local fields around us where it's spread as a nitrogen rich biofertilizer. This product has, has actually proved very beneficial to the, uh, to the farmers. Uh, over tests they've managed to gain a much higher yield from the, uh, the digestate fertilizer that they've used from our process compared to a chemical fertilizer that they've used in the past. And when I look at this process that we've seen here today, it's ticking a lot of boxes, it's it doing is. a lot of things right, it's solving a lot of problems. Why hasn't this gone to scale? It requires uh, legislative support. There are incentives that we use uh, to effectively fund the plant over the long term. One of the barriers really, again, for this specific industry, is how do you get more food waste out of that 10 million tonnes? It's a huge problem for the UK, it's a huge problem for the world. If you look at Scotland and Wales, both of those uh, sort of sets of authorities have done a really good job in forcing food waste out of landfill. If I look at, uh, if I look at where food waste goes today, there is still a huge amount that goes to landfill, typically out of our householders' bags. There's a huge amount that goes to incineration, which arguably scientifically is not the right thing to do. So we've got to do more. There's still millions of tons out there to go after. What we see around us here is the hosting of various waste tires in this depot. Uh, on a daily basis, there's a process where each and every transporter who has been uh, allocated an area of about 50 kilometer radius has been given an opportunity to daily go and collect tires from the different dealerships. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, waste pickers who collect as individuals mm -hmm. and they earn a living. Mm -hmm. So daily there's a transporter who benefits, there's also a waste picker who benefits. Kumla, uh, how long have you been doing this job and what does it entail? What does a normal day look like for you? Okay, I've been doing this for, uh, it's about a year and six months now. And I'm, west, I'm collecting waste tires and my daily routine is uh, I go to certain places where I usually know that there is tires around there and then I collect to the nearby place where I store them and call Redisa to come and pick the tires up. The thing that makes me get to work is because I know that the scores is far higher than just repurposing tires. We have mothers who um, have never owned bank accounts in their lives. The first time I went out into the field to register our first group of waste collectors into the program, um, when we returned after the training program, we issued them with their bank cards. And I had a 53-year-old woman break out in tears, and I thought, what have I done to offend her? And she said to me, nobody's ever done this for me. You don't understand. It was impossible for me to get a bank account before, because I don't have a residential address. I don't have a, a, a credit record, so there was just no way. But through, the, through us becoming a collective bargaining tool, we were able to negotiate with the banks to empower these people to, to have a bank account. I have transporters um, in our network who would write me letters to advise 
on the fact that this is the first time ever they've been able to pay school fees. What a pleasure it is to own their own home, to have that. So this waste into worth is far more than just talking about the commodity or converting the commodity. Worth speaks into self-worth. It speaks into growth. It speaks into development of people. And I think because our heart is in the right place, we do know that through um, pushing for the circular economy, we're able to change lives. How do you see the benefits of being involved in a business like Redisa. Uh, three years back when I started with Redisa, I was not working. I didn't have a car. The only thing I had was, uh, was a small buggy with a trailer. And uh, I managed to register with them and I was appointed as a transporter. So far after three years I managed to get four trucks. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm giving work. I'm giving, I'm giving something to eat to about six families. Yeah. So Redisa really helped me, even my children, they go to a better school. I also managed to pay all my debt. There's a lot of uh, social benefits and economic spin-offs. Can you give us a specific example of somebody you know whose life has been changed by being involved in Redisa? An example is me. Ah, yes, well, <laughs> my tell, life, us your, tell us your story. My life has, has changed completely. I got very, very sick. and. Uh, at my age, I couldn't get any job. In life, if you're not working, it's very, very difficult. More especially if you're not a thief and you, you don't know what to do and then you get an opportunity like this. It has changed me forever. And I'm a better man and my family enjoys the opportunities that I, I give them, you know, and, and they benefit, you know. Mm. We, we, we have food in the table. And also, you know, as Africans, we have a, it's not only your family that benefits. It's not only my family. There are other uh, close families that benefit also, you know. I'm currently employing 14 people. I, used to, I started with about six people. They, they also support their families. So my life has changed to see other people happy and also myself happy and healthy. If, if, if only all the other industries can look at this other waste processes in this fashion, I think we, it can go a long way to creating a healthy South Africa. And also we're having a lot of businesses spring up and, and, and people getting jobs. Remember, when you talk of waste pickers, you're talking of a family, probably the whole, the entire family is not working. Now suddenly they are able to collect tires and these tires bring food into the table. And that what motivates me that mm. at least people are getting jobs and people are doing something, you know. Waste is worth something if people can put their mind into it. And when I grew up, there was 1976 where we banned these tires. But today I'm creating jobs with these tires. So I'm very proud to say my end, <laughs> my end will be a, a better one, you know, and, and I'm happy to live in this South Africa that we are in today. Unlike a linear economy where we're taking, we're making and we're disposing of products, in this case in South Africa, we're taking, we're making, we're not disposing, we're diverting into another industry which is looking at um, beneficiating and transforming those tyres into commodities to add to economic growth, to allow for job creation and to allow for small business development. This is a, an OTR downsizing process. Okay. So basically what we do, we take a whole OTR tyre, which uh, range from 1.5 tonnes to about 6 tonnes per tyre. This, the scale of the operation, we can, is, I think we can do up to 120 tons per day. Okay, and after that it goes off and becomes other products, other uses? Y yes, it then be becomes a raw material for other processes and those processes could be to feed it as a, what they call tire derived fuel for cement kilns. You can take it further and convert it to what we call crumb that is used for making rubber products and used for road paving. And then there is also a process called uh, pyrolysis, which is the extraction of oils or fuel 
from these tires. Now, what is it that personally motivates you to be involved in a business like this? You know, you, you could be doing many other things. Uh, is, is there a personal drive? It's about where we grew up. I mean, tires were always an unspoken uh, problem. They, they became breeding grounds for all kinds of uh, 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 diseases, even though we don't have malaria in this part of the country, but mosquitoes and other insects still carry other diseases. In, in summer, after rains, you know, it, as children became very difficult, we could hardly play outside because of the amount of uh, mosquitoes that would have been bred in these tires. But also in winter, I mean, if you go to most townships, uh, the smog is there, yes, there is coal also, but a, a huge part of it uh, also came from uh, tires, and tires, unlike coal, also emit a lot of toxins when they, they, mm. they are bent. So you are not only looking after the physical environment, but you are looking at the, the health and well-being mm. of the mm. surrounding communities. So for me, those are like, you know, the, the, the reasons that motivate me mm. and that excite me about this business because it does really excite me. So what kinds of things can this rubber crumb become? Uh, it can be used in various industries. Uh, I think the most common one is that uh, used as infill for synthetic sports surfaces uh, for football or, or soccer. Um, we're actually looking at developing ways that it can be utilized in industry. So uh, we're looking at the paint industry, for instance, that utilizes it uh, for non-slip paint. Um, we're manufacturing acoustic underlays and acoustic uh, products that are utilized uh, globally from one of our other factories. Uh, we're exporting those products to 45 countries currently. And also we've developed a market for paving uh, bricks, uh, interlocking mats for sloping driveways. So they really play a very strong role throughout the value chain. And when you talk about the kinds of products that come out of here, it sounds to me like those products didn't just exist, you had to find uh, ways to create new products. So I'm just interested in the role of innovation in this whole circular economy as well. That's right. I think South Africa uh, in the utilization of rubber crumb is in its infancy. Um, it's not uh, like many developed markets like in the United Kingdom and the United States where it's in a stage of maturity. So our role as a processes or recycler is to help uh, from an innovation perspective to try and work with other industries uh, to create uh, innovative products from the products that we're producing here and also uh, work with research institutions to try and um, spin more or generate more uh, innovation uh, coming through. Our experience shows us that particularly those countries which are less developed particularly those countries which don't have an, in, an industry which already exists, and those countries which have a lot high labor force are very well placed in order to actually deal with their ways in this particular way. Creating in the developing countries a cleaner environment is game-changing to the whole future of our, our people in the Ursus. It is proven that when children grow up as, and adults grow up in a cleaner and more, more good environment is that they have become more productive and actually create better countries. We are in the middle of the mountains, but uh, actually the land that is part of the metropolitan district of Quito is quite diverse in altitude. So we have many different ecosystems, uh, some of them very fragile. So we are extremely committed in protecting them, uh, ensuring the next generations to enjoy it as we can do the beauties of our city and the surrounding areas. 90% of the, our territory is uh, rural and is a high endemic uh, biodiversity. So we are in the future foreseen to declare a specific protected areas what we have now in natural resources.
it is obvious that mobility is the main problem in the city, public transportation issues, traffic jams. So we are approaching those problems uh, through a sustainable vision. We started the construction of the first subway line in the city. This is the largest infrastructure project ever in Quito. Uh, we are also building a cable car system to serve those areas of the city that are located in the top of the mountains. Uh, and that's uh, not only an environmentally friendly project, but it is also an initiative that helps to regenerate areas that have been poor for decades. And uh, Quito is uh, highly known because of uh, these, uh, the efforts of uh, conserving the watersheds to provide Quito for a long-term uh, water uh, in a, a better quality and in quantity. So um, we have developed this specific uh, water fund uh, that is very well known in, and it was a pioneer uh, fund in Latin America and now other cities are doing the same thing to conserve and, uh, these watersheds. We're also pursuing the vision of, of a sustainable city through an appropriate uh, waste management system. De la descomposición de la basura que ingresa acá al relleno sanitario, obtenemos otros dos productos. Uno, el biogás, el metano, que indicamos que se transformaba en energía eléctrica, y el otro que es el exiliado. Ese es un líquido altamente contaminado. Nosotros tenemos plantas tecnificadas, ¿sí? que, donde realizamos una descontaminación de este líquido, cumpliendo una norma ambiental, antes de descargarlos a un cuerpo receptor, que en este caso es del río. Aquí en el relleno sanitario hacemos un proceso de purificación de esa agua, ¿sí? producto de la descomposición de la basura. We have provided more than 40% of the city with uh, waste containers. We are also uh, working towards introducing in the city a culture of recycling, separating waste from the very beginning. Likewise, we are working towards uh, protecting our natural resources prohibiting certain uh, activities that are harmful for the environment, like for example, minery, which uh, it is uh, actually an activity that some uh, sectors of the country were pursuing in that area, but we actually prohibited that through an ordinance in the metropolitan district. So these are a few examples that reflect how we are fully committed in making our city not only a sustainable one, but also an example for the region. It's crucial to, to be sensitive, to be passionate about the things you do, and uh, sustainability is the one that uh, is a, a vocation. It's a, a, a grain that you can add to, to see that natural resources can be conserved for future generations, for our kids, uh, for our city, for our planet. Ecuador is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, and we try to keep it that way. So we're putting our grain of sand in, in the process and helping a bit. This is all about recycling of yes. waste, specifically Tetra Pak. Now, I know a little bit about Tetra Pak, and to me it seems like a really difficult uh, material to recycle because you've got a layer of cardboard, you've got a layer of foil, and a layer of plastic. How do you deal with that? The thing is, we have two main products. One, which is made from the three types of uh, material, and the other one, we take the cardboard out through a process uh, that's called hydropulping, and we use the cardboard to recycle paper, and we keep the foil and the plastic to make the products you see here. Okay, and give me some idea. I mean, what kind of products can you make from Tetra Packs? It's amazing how versatile Tetra Pak really is. We make roofs. Our roofs can last 30 years. We have chairs, we have outdoor furniture, which is hand-woven in Ecuador, and we're sending that to the coast. So they, they're probably the most skillful artisans in, in Ecuador. We have jewelry and we have the countertops, and we're doing whole kitchens and bathrooms with Tetra Pak. So we're turning waste into something 
amazing, like something you would have in your house and you would never know it's Tetra Pak. What do you see as, as the future for businesses like this? Well, it's, uh, it's a great business and we're actually trying to expand internationally because the biggest impact of this is the transportation. So we don't want to bring Tetra bricks from Mexico or from Panama, but we want them to process them locally and that way it will be less uh, of an impact for the environment. I mean, you see Tetra Pak as a resource, it's an input to your process, and yet I understand that in, in other countries they actually pay to get rid of it. Yes, and they, and they pay a lot to get rid of it. So not only are you you're getting rid of a problem, but yep. actually it's, it's just creating a product for you, so it's a business opportunity, everybody yes. wins. We can make pretty much any product that's using wood or cement or non-renewable materials and make something even better. The, the quality of our products are better than the ones that are in the market right now. So it's, it's a great business. We produce about 20,000 cars per year. Uh, our production is one of the most important here in Ecuador because the market share of the company is about 48% of the total market in the country. All right, let's, let's look at these crates over here and explain to me uh, what's, what's special about them. The special thing about these boxes is that they are returnable. It means we can collapse them, they go again to Japan, so the people there uh, take new parts and goes over again to Ecuador. It happens about 10 times before the, the box is not, not useful anymore. Okay, and when you say the box, you're really talking about this metal frame. Okay. It's much stronger, it doesn't break like the wood or like other uh, casings. It's a very elegant solution. Yeah, it's a very simple idea, but in fact, the, the results are very good for us because we are avoiding to buy another metal boxes. What are the achievements you've made here on, on, on environment? Our calculation is that at this moment, uh, the 99% of the waste from the company, they are totally reusable or recycled. It means all the material has a solution or has a partner who makes anything with that material. So the whole chassis of the car gets dipped into the water okay. with lots of chemicals. What happens to that water and those chemicals? Okay, the water goes to a wastewater treatment plant, so the water is recovered. We take off all the chemicals, all the hazardous materials, and the water comes back. It's a closed loop for the water. Amazing, so you've got two closed loops there. The water is going round and round yep. your system and the chemical sludge waste coming out of that process goes to the cement company yep. Holsim and they use it as a fuel for their process. Yeah. Here we receive all the water. We try, try to mix it up a little bit. We regulate the pH of the wastewater and then we apply a biological treating system that is intended to remove all the organic uh, compounds that are present in the water. Okay, so it comes in, I guess, through pipes and there's some treatment tanks here. Yes. And then it comes through to this. Yes. This is the sewer where it used to be discharged. Exactly. We used to discharge like from five to 6,000 cubic meters of treated water per month. Okay. Right here. And now you just charge nothing? Yes. Uh, we uh, noted that there was an opportunity for us because we were uh, discharging like really good quality water to a sewage system. So we decided to uh, promote a project to implement an ultra filtration and a reverse osmosis system that will allow us to uh, get a water with potable quality. Mm -hmm. And this water will be used in our biggest consumer of the plant, that is the paint shop. So behind us is, is the, the technical process, yes. and you designed this? Yes. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. As an environmental engineer, and you get it uh, to what kind of quality? I mean, is it drinkable quality? Yes. Really? Water is drinkable, yes. So I could drink a glass of this water and I won't die? No, you wouldn't die. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should do that now. I, okay. I, I brought a glass. That's the water quality we get, we get here. Okay. And this is water that's come out of that the plant that we were just in, yes. with all the chemicals in the paint and the treatment, yes. and now, now should it should be drinkable. Yes. Well, it's purified water. Well done. Cheers.
<laughs> it's like just drinking distilled drinking. water, right? Yes. Uh, exactly. Completely pure. Completely pure. You can keep going with industrial process while you take care of the environment and while you do something to solve some kind of problems. This project was not approved because of the financial profit or benefit. It was, this project was approved because it has a lot of environmental and social benefits. Esta es una región muy húmeda, pero a pesar de ser tan húmeda y aquí llueve mucho, es muy difícil conseguir agua en, en la tierra. ¿no? Entonces la única manera de, de conseguir agua o de poder traer esa agua, esa agua que está aquí en las nubes, es con árboles. Bueno, yo vine a trabajar en esta granja hace más o menos eh, aproximadamente un año y medio atrás. Queremos disminuir el área de disminuir la presión sobre el bosque que existe aquí. En esta región existe mucha presión sobre el bosque porque la gente lo que hace es normalmente agrandar eh, el, el área de pastizales eh, botando montaña, botando bosque y, y nosotros más bien hemos hecho lo contrario. Nosotros hemos disminuido el área de potreros y, y hemos intensificado la, la práctica, por ejemplo, de conservación, de hacer más bosques, de reforestar, de recuperar áreas que aquí estaban perdidas. Esto lo hemos logrado, eh, por ejemplo, la, eh, normalmente en esta región, en esta área, se mantiene un animal por hectárea o, o inclusive menos. Nosotros lo estamos llevando a, a, a manejar tres, cuatro animales por hectárea. ¿sí? Muchas veces es, es, es un poco difícil que la gente crea en algo o en un sistema sin antes verlo. Lo que puede hacer es compararlo y ver a la final que es un sistema que no es tan difícil hacerlo, que solamente implica un poco más de trabajo, pero que a la larga da unos tremendos resultados. Is there a way that um, you also reutilize your resources? La otra situación también es la cosecha del agua o o la reutilización del agua de lluvia en, por medio de los tejados se conducen eh, con cañerías y, y se llevan a tanques de almacenamiento de reservorio y esta agua la podemos volver a reutilizar como agua de bebida para los animales, como agua para limpieza de equipos y para muchas otras cosas. ¿sí? La otra situación es también nosotros reutilizamos el estiércol que se produce aquí con los animales. Tenemos nuestra visión o nuestro enfoque está en una fertilización puramente orgánica, sin el uso de químicos ni pesticidas para producir pasto. What keeps you motivated? What inspires you to take care of the environment while you also take care of your cows? Eh, tengo hijos vienen otras generaciones atrás que se merecen un planeta limpio, un planeta eh, que les ofrezca unas buenas condiciones de vida. Ok, ahora estamos aquí en la comunidad de Yunguida, ¿no? Una comunidad de campesina que viene desde hace 20 años trabajando de manera organizada, ¿no? Eh, con el fin de buscar alternativas sostenibles, ¿no? Ya que aquí en la comunidad, ¿sí? Eh, hace 20 años atrás, la actividad principal fue la extracción de los recursos naturales. Entonces, ahora pues después de 20 años, la gente ha entendido que y ha logrado encontrar otras alternativas de desarrollo sostenible, ¿no? What was this area like in the past? Esta área eh, hace 20 años era totalmente deforestada, es decir, toda esta área, ¿no es cierto?, alrededor de unas 3.000 hectáreas eran dedicadas básicamente para el tema ganadero. La gente aquí practicaba una ganadería a gran escala, ¿no? Eran grandes haciendas que producían leche, grandes haciendas que producían ganado para carne, ¿sí? Eso era lo que teníamos, era todo potreros básicamente, ¿no? Ahora, eh, pues después de 20 años que hemos logrado un poco cambiar la mentalidad de la gente, 
pues hemos ido recuperando esas áreas que han estado degradadas, ¿no? Y la gente ha ido eh, cambiando sus actividades eh, económicas, digamos, ¿no? Entonces, ahora ya no se practica una ganadería a gran escala, más bien se practica en ese sentido, pues tenemos ahí también otras actividades eh, productivas como la producción de frutas nativas, huertos orgánicos, un poco como para que ayude a conservar el, el área en general. Sin embargo, pues este sí, o sea, estamos muy conscientes de que todavía, todavía tenemos muchas áreas que necesitan ser recuperadas, ¿no? necesitan, necesitan mucho trabajo para irles recuperando. ¿sí? Y, ¿no es cierto?, detrás de estas montañas está la gran cantidad de bosque primario que todavía tenemos acá en la comunidad. ¿sí? Están aproximadamente unas 5.000 hectáreas de bosque primario y aquí en esta parte son unas 3.000 hectáreas. Es decir, nuestro trabajo de la comunidad no está enfocado aquí en esta finca comunitaria, está enfocado alrededor de unas 8.000 hectáreas en total que estamos trabajando. ¿no? Involucrarme en este proyecto eh, ha sido muchas cosas en realidad. Acabo de construir mi casa y mi padre me dijo, esos árboles tú sembraste, puedes utilizar para construir tu casa después de 20 años, mira. Entonces, esas cosas de las que nos han motivado eh, a nosotros acá en la comunidad seguir trabajando porque estamos convencidos de que se puede manejar los recursos de manera adecuada, de manera sostenible. Seeing that you're protecting this for the future generation, that you really believe that uh, is, is wonderful to hear. Principal objetivo que, que nosotros nos hemos trazado es llegar a vivir bien en nuestra comunidad, llegar a vivir en armonía con los recursos naturales que tenemos, sí, y sobre todo eh, que nuestros hijos puedan vivir en un lugar seguro y sano, ¿no? So really, you know, we have to engage people in this and we have to make them want to actually be a part of this equation and get their participation. Part of our problem in, in moving towards secularity is most people neither see the, the, the importance of it nor exactly know how to do it. They're not engineers and, and actually very often it's much easier to see the, the, the complications than it is to see the uh, longer term uh, benefits. And that's why I think the, the political leadership and the government endorsement and sub, you know, subsidy for the right sorts of activities are, is, is so crucial. I think businesses have to lead. I, I, in my time working in NGOs or in business, I haven't seen the leadership that the world needs from governments. Again, I think governments in some places and sometimes are, are, are more short term than businesses. Well, it's very hard for governments which are in a short cycle of voting and elections, four or five years, to make long term decisions. And so what we find is that sustainability is about investing for the long term and the pressure is all short term. And especially in a democracy, what is often very difficult is asking the public to make short-term sacrifices for a long-term gain. We love to accumulate stuff, I think. Um, it's a very human uh, condition. You know, we've, we've kind of, uh, we relate stuff back to, to our sense of self and um, our, our values, if you like, and our status in society. So to suddenly give up stuff and to access it rather than, than own it outright. It's, it's going to be quite a, quite a step for us to make and getting that messaging right is, is going to be critical going forward and the circular economy community hasn't really worked that out yet, I don't think. They haven't really done much work around the, the public engagement piece that's needed. We expect, even in our countries, in our economies, to always be growing. If we're not growing, it's a crisis. We expect our businesses to always be growing. So we've got a set of expectations which are actually fundamentally in conflict with the finite planet that we live on. On the one hand, humans have always been at the frontiers. They've always been expanding, conquering territories. And generally, it's been a, a path of increased consumption, increased utilization of land and of energy. That's been the story of human evolution. On the other hand, it's only fairly recently that we have been so wealthy that we haven't had to think about reusing or recycling. 
It wasn't that long ago when, whether it was the milkman bringing milk bottles back for us to reuse or darning our socks when they had holes in them, this was, this was normal. And it was because it was too expensive to do something else. Yeah, I think one of the changes that's happened is we've lost sight of what makes us happy. You know, our fundamental human needs hasn't changed, but the way that we satisfy those needs has changed. In a way, we could say rather facetiously, we invented advertising, we invented consumption to say that you can't be happy unless you have more stuff. Whereas, of course, for thousands of years, we were happy without stuff. That's one of the elements of the take, make, waste, throw away society that we've bought into. And we need to really question that. We need to teach our kids that it's not okay just to want more. It's not necessarily going to make them happier. There is something about human psychology where we want to feel that we're growing. We have to just think about what growth means. Does growth always mean more? Or does it mean development? Does it mean we're increasing our satisfaction, that we're evolving, that we're learning more as a society, as a city, as a family? Well, I think the linear economy is, is, is the prevailing model because, because simply the world is just not in tune or, or necessarily aware of the circular uh, model. And it's, and it's economic and societal uh, uh, benefits. So it seems to us that part of the challenge is, is uh, that uh, the circular stakeholders are, are still working in silos. So they're not all, the community isn't one community yet. And the purpose, our purpose of forming this, uh, this uh, uh, Accelerating the Circular Economy program is in fact to, to bring all these stakeholders into the space so that they can so that they can form partnerships that will help speed up and scale. And of course, you know, this includes uh, technology and new innovations. Uh, this includes uh, policymakers who can create regulatory frameworks that, that enable circular business models to flourish. And this, of course, uh, includes uh, investors. What needs to happen? Companies need to make uh, need to make these products. Uh, well, they need to make more of them, more affordable. So they, they they need to scale. These ideas need to scale and become commercially feasible um, in a way that's also affordable. They all carry a premium. And if you want circular solutions to uh, to basically take off, um, they need to be made more affordable. We could enter maybe 10 years time, we could see a circular economy that's just built for the elite. Um, and actually, what happens then about access? You know, um, if, if ordinary people can't access these products, then they're, then they're not going to benefit from them. And that's, that's a real problem. If we over-engineer the circular economy, we'll never get it off the drawing board, certainly not to hundreds, if not thousands of companies. So take Marks and Spencer, for example. We sell 35,000 different product lines. I mean, that's a big challenge to think circular. But if I look at it another way and say, well, 28,000 items are clothing, how do we sell clothing in a fundamentally different way? How do we ensure that customers get a great product that lasts as long as it possibly can, but when you finish with it, there is an easy way to return it to Marks and Spencer? And that's what we've done with our shopping campaign with Oxfam. Return your used M&S clothing to us or to Oxfam. We donate it to Oxfam. They reuse it, they resell it. Uh, there's 99.9% .9 of the fibre they get back is reused to great value for Oxfam and their overseas development work. That's fantastic. It's done with real scale and real authority. Now we get back three to four million items a year. That's not 100% of what we sell, it's 1%. So we're, again, we're challenging ourselves to how we get that to scale. But that's still a fairly significant number, three or four million items a year. So we've got a challenge there about simplification, make it as easy as possible. The second challenge we've got is to actually get businesses working together on this, particularly com competitors. We will not create a sustainable economy simply because little Marks and Spencer decides it wants to do it on its own. We need to show as many different participants in the UK and global economy are doing it. Partly because everybody's raw material is somebody else's waste, is somebody else's opportunity for, for resource as well. So the more people are participating, the more that materials can be used. The more we can get the synergies and the efficiencies of scale collection of materials and brought, bring them back as well. So by, only by doing those two things, simplification and scaling it across many different businesses, will we create a truly circular economy. I think it really does come down to cost. There's a lot of local authorities who are doing the right thing. I think what we need is some support from the government to try and push that forward. And don't forget, it's not just householders. You've got retail organisations, you've got commercial organisations, 
How do we support those guys? How do we make them think more about their food waste? There's an awful lot going on, don't get me wrong, people are really focused on it, but I think there's another push we could make to try and get another slice of that food waste out of the residual stream into plants like these. The trouble is, with, with the circular economy, you can't just design um, a circular product or service in isolation. The whole system has to change with it. You know, that circular product will only go so far if you've still got a linear economic system supporting it. We can now use 30 years of claim and shame as a true innovation engine. We can reinvent all our materials to be good for biological or technical systems and we need the support of the people because if they just sit back and relax, we will be too slow. And I say, let's celebrate life. Let's welcome people to this planet. Then we could even be 20 billion people on this planet and be good for the other species as well. So it's up to us. We now have the expertise together. It's now time to act. Right off the bat, it's increased revenues, it's uh, reduced cost, it's reduced risk, increased tangible values. In other words, it could be brand recognition. And there's also the uh, positive impact on, on society and the environment. So I think, I think this is a, a clear, clear solution for a triple bottom line. If you think about starting a business today, designing a business around a circular economy philosophy, ultimately is going to give you better returns in the long run because it's going to, be, it's going to uh, use your sources more efficiently, it's going to use more efficient energy, it's going to treat customers, I believe, in a way that over the next five or ten years customers will want to be treated. So I, I think commercially it's, 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 a, it's a savvy way to progress. Why would you throw something away that's, that's valuable? Why would you do that? Uh, and, and, I, and I hope, I think it's the West who are perhaps lagging behind. We are in such a throwaway economy whilst in the places where there is, there is less, uh, less stuff, then I think we're seeing that they are using it more efficiently. We've um, embarked on a journey towards sustainability a number of years ago in many of our other companies, and we've realised that sustainability in the environment uh, provides us with opportunities, and we don't see environmental legislation or environmental mandate, mandates as a threat. We see it as an opportunity from a cost perspective, from a brand perspective, from developing products that utilize a high content of recycled materials. So essentially, it's created a platform for us to innovate. There are a lot of customers that value uh, sustainability and uh, doing good for the environment, and they choose for interface uh, on behalf of that. But still a lot of customers uh, for a lot of customers, sustainability is only a secondary consideration. They primarily choose for us for the prime function that they expect from our product. It's design, uh, it's uh, low cost of ownership, it is uh, functionality. And what is fantastic, that is a lot of these design uh, features and a lot of these functionality uh, features uh, have their uh, uh, origin in a sustainable development. In that sense I'm pretty optimistic because you see that more and more companies are uh, getting that and, uh, and are realizing that. I think it's also pretty clear that uh, companies with a strong sustainability uh, vision are often the more successful uh, companies. So that is an inspiration uh, in itself. And look at Interface, uh, we are with the distance the market leader in, in our industry. We are uh, performing also financially very, very well. And uh, yeah, we are an inspiration source uh, for the industry uh, in general and certainly for the carpet industry. If you're using material which is, was otherwise waste material, if you're getting very um, significant reductions in, in pollution and waste uh, and, and you're using waste material as your fundamental building blocks, then you ought to be able to reduce costs and also improve output from the same resource base. But last year we gave a check back to our CFO, £180 million pounds saved. Less energy, less waste, less packaging, less carry bags. It all saved money for the business. Fantastic, she can open new stores to help us grow into the future. Also brought us more than that. We're the most, one of the most trusted brands in the UK. We've got high levels of trust and confidence for our employee base, which drives them to go through the extra mile through a lot of change in, in the retail marketplace. It's created more resilience in our supply chains as they're increasingly affected by social challenge and extreme weather events as well. So Marks & Spencer is a fundamentally better business today for doing plan over the last decade, but 
it is not enough and we need to redouble our efforts into the future. And equally, the business case will be many times larger in the future if we land this model properly for our customers. Uh, Renault is able to produce from 30 to 50% cheaper for the customer because they've been able to optimize this process and about 80% of uh, their cost of production, so energy, water, and so on and so forth, has been reduced drastically as well. So if we take Renault as a case study, it definitely shows that circular economy not only is good for us, but is also financially very strong to generate uh, competitive advantage. In this case, because of cost reduction and, uh, and the attractivity uh, of the same process uh, for the same product actually in the market. Certainly, if you talk to the likes of the World Economic Forum, if you talk to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, if you talk to um, if you talk to McKinsey, they will say yes, without a doubt. They've done a lot of detailed modelling work that suggests massive opportunities. Um, for, for companies who work towards a circular economy. And recently, I think a report came out by Accenture, who are a consultancy very much engaged in this agenda. And they said for companies that um, basically move towards circular business models by 2030, there's a 4.5 trillion US dollar reward just waiting for them. For the manufacturer, it's great because it helps them, I think, in terms of um, their supply chains, in terms of safeguarding raw materials going forward. So companies now are being faced with kind of price volatility um, in their supply chains with regards to how they source certain materials um, needed for their, for their products and, and services. And if they can actually take back these materials again and again and reuse them again and again in their own supply chains, um, it just creates, it future proofs, if you like, their business model going forward. It gives them security of supply. Adopting a new model, uh, an economic model, requires um, probably new uh, innovation uh, approaches to things. It could be a product innovation, um, could be a process innovation. So, so in essence, the, uh, a, a great positive impact of, of, a, of a model like the survey economy would be um, innovation. Um, it is uh, then we have, um, and, and this could be disruptive. It could be disruptive innovation uh, in a positive way, of course. We can never underestimate the power of the social impact that you're achieving through the circular economy. I think the world is facing a number of challenges. I mean, we have a challenge of environmental impacts, but we also have a challenge of the divide between rich and poor. And through the circular economy, you're able to address this problem because there's a place for everybody in the circular economy. So as I travel and I see many beautiful parts of the world, beautiful people, beautiful places, nature in amazing bounty, whether it's you know, the jungles of Ecuador and Costa Rica or the beaches of Sri Lanka. You know, a lot of those are in danger. They're under threat. Uh, it could very well be that one or two generations from now they don't get to see those. And that makes me quite sad. We're better than this. We're smarter than this. You know, we've created the problem. We can solve the problem. We just have to be more conscious about how we live, about our impacts, and I think we are getting smarter. It's one of the things that, with our connected world today, with our high-tech world, we're getting much, much better at. What's emerging is a collective consciousness. The idea of a living planet is coming alive. You know, it's really a choice about whether we want to coexist with the planet, whether we want to live in harmony with the planet or whether we're somehow like a parasite on the planet. And we know what happens to parasites. If their host dies, then they die too. The only way that this works is if sustainability, circular thinking, closing the loop is applicable to everyone. This is not some luxury for the rich and wealthy and privileged. It has to be a solution for people who are on lower incomes, perhaps people who are in developing countries. This must be an option where they can make choices about how they consume, how they produce, that bring them a direct benefit. And it's not impossible because a lot of that circular thinking goes back to a time when resources were scarce. Whether it be during the World Wars or the Great Depression, that's when we were forced to think about frugality. 
to say, well, how do we reuse things? How do we recycle things? So no matter where you are in society, no matter who you are, you can make those choices, you can educate your children not to just throw things away, not to just leave the lights on, to think about whether you really need something, to think about where it goes when you throw it away. These are all things that we can all do. It's not the privilege of the few, but rather the responsibility of us all. To see a world emerging all around us in which landfills grow taller than skyscrapers, and in which rivers run dry, in which forests are burning. You know, these things make me sad. And I don't want to be melodramatic, but if you look at the numbers, if you look at the trends, it's not good news. What I want us to focus on is what's possible because I've seen that change can happen really fast and that that dystopian world, that world of our nightmares, is not inevitable. We need to think about this revolution that we're going through as a way in which we can make our mark on this earth, a positive footprint. It's up to us to be part of the solution. And actually we're all looking for meaning in life, or what could be more meaningful than making life flourish rather than destroying life. We can buy into this mission. We can make it our personal mission to be part of the solution. At the end of the day, what do you want to tell your grandchildren? Were you part of the problem or were you part of the solution? Do you want to be part of the decline of civilization? Or do you want to be on the side of hope, of reinvention, of recreation, of the kind of life and the kind of earth that we were really meant to enjoy? The choice is always is yours.